What is going on, guys? Welcome to Big Time Football Talk. Thanks for tuning in. Um, I hope you enjoyed the last last segment with my dad calling in. I thought that was some really great stuff. I think guys should, uh, if you haven't watched that video, go back and check that out. A lot of good stuff, especially if you want to hear good stuff on uh, the Stafford trade and uh, the NFL draft. So thank you guys so much for uh, um, your support. And, uh, yep, hopefully you guys enjoy the video. So let's get straight to it. Uh, Carson Wentz traded to the Indianapolis Colts. And if you know, if you follow my channel, if you're a big, a longtime follower, you know I'm not a big Carson Wentz guy. But the bottom line here is the Colts have uh, defense in place and the offense in place uh, for Carson Wentz to make a Super Bowl run. And it's interesting, you know, um, Wentz and Goff first and second picks in the draft, and both of those guys now um, coincidentally traded. Um, and, and, you know, that's always kind of the thing. Guys that are drafted in the first round get a lot more opportunities and a lot more benefit of the doubt, and they kind of tend to hang around the league longer. And, look, I, there's people saying Carson Wentz a top 6'10 player, quarterback, whatever. I mean, that's just ridiculous. But Carson Wentz is good enough. He's talented enough. He's not, he's not an elite quarterback. He'll never be an Aaron Rodgers. He'll never be a Tom Brady. He'll never be a Mahomes, obviously, but he's good enough to get them to a Super Bowl. You don't have to be great to get to a Super Bowl. You have to have uh, good coaching, good players around you, good offensive line. And the Colts all have that in the mix. And, uh, you know, this is a team that has a lot of cap space. Um, so they could make some other moves. And a good young receiving core, Michael Pittman Jr. is a guy that really stood out to me. So Bottom line is the Colts are trying to make a, uh, a Super Bowl push here. And it's a good start with uh, Carson Wentz. His team is going to have an opportunity to have a, uh, you know, a memorable season and, uh, you know, make the Super Bowl and potentially win it. But remember, a lot of guys could get to the Super Bowl. Not a lot of guys could win it. So don't be surprised if, uh, you know, Wentz chokes this one away. Look, look at Jimmy Garoppolo. Uh, 49ers, everything in place. Jimmy Garoppolo, not quite good enough. Jared Goff, Rams, everything in place. Coaching, not quite good enough to get it done in the big game. So, you know, I'd love to see it because I, I've i ripped on Wentz. So that would um, – but uh, – you know, I'm not. I'm not a guy that will. I root for a. I root for. You know, I. I want to be proved wrong. You know that a lot of analysts they they want to. Uh, you know they can't stand being wrong. You know, I hope. I hope once you know proves me wrong. But I would. You know, I'd be. I'd love to be able to back it up. And you know, if uh, you know he makes a super run, chokes there. It would be kind of, um, you know, fun to see. But, you know, it could be a lot of pressure like Stafford in L.A. Could be a lot of pressure for Carson Wentz uh, to win a Super Bowl this year with the uh, with the Eagles. So we'll see how it pans out. But, uh, yeah, second-round pick this year in the 2021 NFL Draft and then a third-round pick – or a third-round pick, excuse me, this year in the 2021 NFL Draft and then a third-round – or a second-round pick in 20 20- – 2022 that could turn into a first round if Carson Wentz plays 75 percent of the snaps for the Colts this year or if next year or if he plays 70 percent and they make the playoffs that'll turn into a first round pick so yeah Eagles now with uh 33.8 million in dead cap space and uh yeah last point it is uh you know it's really prove it time for Wentz because uh you know, has had some flashes, but, uh, you know, that's back when the Eagles roster was a lot better. Let's be honest, you know, Brandon Graham and some of their edge rushes were younger. Their defense was younger. Their offensive line didn't have the injuries. So really put up or shut up time for Wentz. We'll see how it pans out. And, uh, so yeah, that's, uh, that's all I have to say on that take. So let's move to it. We're going to talk about some draft questions, uh, for the 2021 NFL draft, starting with the first one. Four QBs in the top 10. Do I think there'll be four QBs taken in the top 10? Yes. Quarterbacks are always in high demand when it comes to the draft. You've seen in years past. Uh, remember the one draft? It was uh, Trubisky, Watson, and Mahomes. And then this year, the, the quarterbacks keep mentioned at the top. I think a lot of teams will be quarterback hungry. I mean, you look at uh, Carolina could sit there at eight and take one. You could have a team like Washington trade up, and it, it's set in stone. There's a, there's going to be one taken in the first round, uh, or for, uh, top ten, excuse me, and that's uh, Trevor Lawrence. It could be Justin Fields, um, could go two or three. Zach Wilson could go two or three to the Jets. Um, so there's likely going to be two. Um, I think it easily will see four in the top ten, which you know coming into coming into the season, people thought that'd be crazy, but I think it will happen this year. So. 
Yeah. The next question is three wide receivers in the top 10. I'm going to say no. But I will say there'll be at least one or two go in the top 10. I think whether it's Devontae Smith, Jamar Chase, Jalen Waddell, those seem to be the consensus top three for most people. Kadarius Toney, um, you know, a lot of people's number four. I think Kadarius Toney it has an argument that he's, you know, could be as good as any of those guys. Does has a lot of great qualities, qualities and ability to cut. So, but uh, yeah, with too much trades for quarterback, I think you'll see one of those top three guys slip, if not two of them. But I think uh, you know, it just depends. It's it's really it's one of those things where it's personal preference. You know, whether you're you know, are you uh, iPhone user or uh, Android? You know, it's kind of that's kind of how it is. You know. With uh, you know Jamar Chase, Waddle, and Devontae Smith, I all th- I think they're all going to be great. I prefer Jalen Waddle just because of his. Uh, I think he's got world class speed. A guy that could run in the four twos. You know, a lot of people said he could be faster than than Henry Ruggs, his teammate who ran a four two eight on his first run and then a four three in his second run. So yeah, Waddle and he's a uh, you know he's smaller too, but he's more short, compact. I mean, it's a it's a more of a solid one eighty five. I mean. Devontae Smith at 175, he's six foot though, so it's he's taller and you know it's it's more um, a lot more skinnier for that for that height. But uh, yeah, Jamar Chase, um, you know it's I it, it, I think the oh, I am not Jamar Chase and I was a guy that loved Jamar Chase last year. I think Jamar Chase um, before he opted out, he was my number one of the big board. But it's just I I didn't get to see this year. You mean you know there's so many guys. I look in the past, and uh, you know Robert Woods and Marquise Lee were kind of like those guys, like at USC. They play early on; they made a big impact, and then you know as they're in their junior senior years, they weren't as productive, and it kind of hurt their draft stock. That's not that I think Jamar Chase would have had a bad year if he played. I think he potentially could have had some down numbers, maybe could have got hurt, whatever, and uh, you know maybe people would be talking to him as maybe the fourth or fifth receiver. So. In the way, the opt out really helped a lot of these guys, like him and Parsons, and you know maybe maybe Rousseau. Um, you know Rousseau was Rousseau was talked about as maybe a top three to top five pick, but now probably likely going to go maybe somewhere in like the fifteen to twenty range, even you know fifteen to thirty two range, somewhere somewhere you know later in the first round now. So yeah. So uh, next is uh, under the radar, guys. I think Dylan Moses from Alabama. You know, Dylan Moses kind of a guy that's uh, forgotten about, very productive and, you know, very good early on at Alabama and then had the injury and missed last year and then, you know, didn't really play uh, to a, you know, a superstar level, was was solid for Alabama, but kind of was just forgotten about because he didn't have, uh, you know, some of the gaudy numbers like tackles for loss and in the interceptions like he did, you know, in, uh, in 2018 when he was, uh, you know, a full-time starter and uh, was the last time he was, you know, uh, didn't deal with uh, a full season without, you know, coming off of a uh, knee injury. So, you know, Dylan Moses, too. And uh, I think even Jace Horn. Jace Horn, kind of the consensus number three corner. But in games I watched Horn, I really just kind of fall in love with him because he's just so – he's so athletic. He's a physical corner. He's a guy that, you know, has I think has could have a super high ceiling in the NFL. It's just – you know, it's always, you know, Patrick Sertan, I think, is just a finished product. You know, like Alabama players, I think that's why Alabama players are, uh, you know, they're always move up in the draft board because they've reached their potential because of the competitiveness, the, the, the um, you know, the great coaching. They're the kind of more finished products. And, uh, yeah, but I think, you know, Jace Horn and, you know, Trevor Mulrig, these are guys that really have, you know, jumped off. When I watch them on tape, kind of just jump – really, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what I'm trying to say, really jump off the tape and really kind of are like, wow, this, you know, this guy with the right coaching. And I felt that way about, you know, I think South Carolina, South Carolina, obviously, you know, um, Muschamp was the coach there. He He's a guy that's really spotted defensive, good defensive talent. I mean, you look at his Florida teams, um, his teammate Javon Kinlaw, I kind of felt like that about last year. And you look, you know, Kinlaw had a pretty solid year for, this year for the 49ers. So, yeah, Chase, Chase Horn. I think is a guy that uh, you can't forget about, even though it's going to be um, Caleb Farley and Patrick Sertan, and that's uh, kind of my next point. Which one do I prefer? I would I would prefer uh, Patrick Sertan because uh, he's just so fundamentally sound. But 
you know, Caleb Farley, his ball, ball skills were outstanding. He's a guy that uh, not only was in the right position a lot of the time to make plays, but a guy that, you know, came down to the interceptions, and which was a, which has been a knock on a lot of guys coming in the NFL. One guy, Jalen Ramsey, I remember Ramsey coming out of college, didn't always make the plays and uh, make a, have a lot of interceptions, but mostly because teams stopped throwing to him but did have a few dropped interceptions. You know, there's a lot of guys with that concern because, you know, in the NFL, defenses want to take away the ball. They don't want to just have pass breakups. I'm one of those guys. I'm so conservative, you know, whether it's Madden or watching my team. A lot of times I'll just take the, the pass breakup because, you know, if you get too gr- aggressive going for the interceptions, it can, uh, you know, lead to a whiff in the receiver gets the uh gets a you know a big play or a touchdown but uh you know defensive coordinators are are uh so turnover happy now turnover is such a crucial part they want guys that uh, have good hands and can you know create those interceptions so and uh yeah you know Sertan's a, a guy that could you know do that also I just think Caleb Farley was uh the best at that and you know Chase Horn too has uh has shown the ability so the top three guys um ability to you know make interceptions and uh you know all super athletic guys i think this is a strong cornerback class i think along with offensive line cornerback is uh you know right up there so yeah uh one of the next burning questions is uh do the jets pick zach wilson at number two and i would say no and here's why it seems like all indications from what I've heard, they want to stick with uh, Sam Darnold. He's their long-term solution. So in that case, why not take Panay Sewell and have a uh, you know a uh, outstanding offensive line? Makai Becton, they drafted last year. Him and Sewell, you've seen how valuable offensive line play is, and you know I think you could even move Sewell to guard. That's not even a knock on Sewell. I've watched some tape on him. Um, and he's a guy that could be just a tremendous guard in the NFL because he's a great run blocker. Still a showing a you know a tremendous ability to pass block. I mean, obviously he is a he is a fantastic um, physical specimen. But uh, yeah, there's nothing wrong with becoming a a great guard in the NFL. Just ask Quentin Nelson, you know. And uh, as the more I've watched football, I've really fallen in love with offensive line play. It's just it's so you know I mean. As much as you want to talk about um, speed, receivers, quarterback, and the offense, the games are still one up front in the trenches. You saw the Chiefs in the Super Bowl with Eric Fisher and Mitch Morris. You saw that the uh, you know the Tampa Bay D line dominated. You saw and uh, you know the Tampa Bay's offensive line was a concern, but uh, this year was a lot better. Ali Marpet, Ryan Jensen, and uh, Tristan Wirfs, the young kid they drafted from Iowa at tackle last year. You saw how valuable offensive line play was to Tampa Bay. And it was a big reason why they. Uh, you know, won the Super Bowl. It wasn't, you know, Tom Brady will get all the accolades. And, uh, you know, Devin White, the linebackers, played outstanding. But at the end of the day, you know, the off the trenches and the offensive line came together. Um, you know, shout out to Dominic and Sue, Jason Pierre, Paul, all those guys. And, you know, Tristan Worth, just a super athletic tackle. It's going to get better and better. And, uh, yeah, the Tampa Bay team that's, you know, drafted so well in the NFL draft. But, uh, yeah, off the side tangent, um, best edge rusher. You know, this is I, this is a draft that's to me has depth at edge rusher. I just can't decide which guy is just going to be that become a phenomenal edge. I think there's a lot of guys that could um, be rotational guys, be could you know could be solid starters. Carlos Basham, I this guy I really like a lot. I just think that uh, yeah, one on ones at the pro at the uh, Pro Bowl look just phenomenal. And uh, you know, Quiddy Pay from Michigan. Even though I've wa- I've watched Quiddy Pay as much as anyone, being a Michigan fan, the production just always wasn't there. And I think this this was a, to me it was a year for Quiddy Pay to shine, and he didn't really quite do so. He had a two sack game against Minnesota, but that's when the game was kind of you know in hand, and you knew Minnesota or you knew they were uh, Minnesota was going to throw the ball, and they kind of were ready to tee off. So there wasn't like a game a wow game for Quiddy Pay this year, even though. Um, in the years prior for Michigan, he is he's shown flashes and has been you know one of their consistent pass rushers. And I think you know I think Quiddy Pay could be a um, a solid starter to rotational guy in the NFL. But I just I don't know if I see him as a you know a lead edge rusher. Um, and uh, you know Carlos Basham maybe Rousseau maybe he's Rousseau is just not super powerful. He's used he used his length and his uh, you know his quickness a lot of times to collapse the pocket and get to quarterbacks from what I saw on tape but I um 
the power aspect is wonder if that's something he could build up. Hopefully he was, uh, you know, keeps training on, you know, getting stronger. Cause at what is it like six, seven, almost six, eight that, that at that size, you can, you know, you can have actually put on some bulk up a little bit, put on some more muscle and become, you know, even more of an elite, uh, prospect and, uh, you know, potentially have the highest ceiling of any, uh, defensive end in the draft. But, uh, yeah, Chase Horn at corner. Um, let's talk a little bit more about him. I think, you know, I think he'll he'll go in the first round. I think uh, kind of reminds me of C.J. Anderson last year. It seemed like Okuda, Okuda was like uh, Caleb Farley and uh, Sertan this year. You know, definitely guys that are going to go top fifteen, and it's you know it's definitely going to be you know um, those guys one of the best talked about as the best, uh, you know, cream of the crop corner. But I think Jace Horn could be that C.J. Henderson, a guy that comes into wherever he goes. If Horn goes to, I don't know who's the team t- drafting in the middle of the draft, uh, go to, say Washington wants to add him. I think he could be a guy that can make an impact on Washington, a team that's a defense that's already got players around them that are, uh, you know, very good. And, it can, you know, when you got good players around and it can elevate your play and, you know, Horn can make an impact. And at the end of the day, people could be saying, you know, oh, Jace Horn, maybe I kind of uh, overlooked him and uh, kind of, uh, you know, ignored some of his flaws that he was, you know, he was a little bit raw. Because I say there's just, um, you know, instinct and, you know, crazy athleticism is, is stuff you can't really coach. And I see that with, uh, you know, Horn, um, like, you know, and Micah Parsons, you know, that's why I don't pass on, you know, freakishly talented guys. I kind of overlook, um, you know, some of those things. Like Devin White, the knock coming out was, you know, instinct wasn't as well, and he was tackling maybe a little too high, excuse me. But, you know, at the end of the day, the potential is there with the right coaching because of the speed. You can't coach a guy to become, you know, freakishly athletic a lot of times. and But, there you know, minor things you can fix and uh, – with Chase Horn, I think there may be some minor things as far as technique goes. But, uh, you know, looks to have fluid hips. One of the things you identify with a lot of great corners is uh, they always have fluid hips. So, yeah, like Horn. And uh, don't be surprised if he uh, ends his rookie year on a uh, very high note with a solid uh, campaign. So that's my take on that. But, uh, yeah, I'm curious to see uh, Todd McShay's next mock draft because uh, this one he's going to have some more uh, trades in it. He was a guy – he had three receivers going in the top ten, and that's something, you know, me and I talked to my dad. He called in, uh, you know, last show. That's something I don't know if I could see necessarily happening because there's just – I don't – I don't know. You just don't – like a lot of people say, you just, the first three to five picks are really kind of reserved for quarterbacks, elite edge rushers, elite tackles. And it's just, I know the league has started, to, it seems like this year they're starting to value more receivers more. You see this with running backs and receivers. You see their value, some years their value is super high, some years their value is super low. For example, you know, Todd Gurley, that one year going in the first round, there was a debate between Kuyper and McShay. Should he go first round? Um, should he go second? What's the value running back? Ezekiel Elliott, was he worth the top five pick at running back? But, uh, yeah, so it's all it all it all depends on how much a team values a wide receiver and how much an impact these guys can make. I think a lot. I think Devonte Smith kind of was the reason this values up because you saw with Devonte Smith, his production was uh, just so high this year, and uh, you think I think a team's thinking if he can come in and just be that productive, be that uh, much of a matchup nightmare. I think that'll you know help a team a lot. So. I think that's I think that was the case with Devontae Smith. And I think that's why he won Heisman because you just saw he was so valuable to Alabama. I mean, just had a monster game against Ohio State in the first half. If he played the, played the whole night game, who whole darn game? Who knows what his uh, what his stats could have been? So, but uh, but yeah, so.
So I just want to check something here. So yeah, looking at other mocks, um, you know, Jalen Waddle, they have him falling. I think if yeah, I think if one of the three were to fall, it would be Jalen Waddle. But that's why I'm just so disappointed. There's not gonna be a combine because you know at pro days, I don't think I kind of question the forty time at the combine. That forty time seems to be so accurate with the machines, and I'd be curious to see what uh, what time Waddle's gonna run, and uh, and yeah, so but uh, you know the pro days could be a lot more hype. So yeah, you know Alabama, Clemson pro days, Ohio State pro days, people are really gonna be locked in. And, uh, you know, hopefully they televise these, and uh, they should be super fun to watch. And, uh, yeah, if you guys haven't seen, you know, Trevor Lawrence looked very good throwing at his pro day. He's going to have to go uh, undergo uh, shoulder surgery, but he he uh, did a good job. He looked like he was in phenomenal shape. Weight was a little lower, but, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's what I call, you know, a minor issue. So hopefully they'll bulk him up when it comes draft time. So. But, uh, yeah, Trevor Lawrence and, you know, Urban Meyer was there. I think a lot of teams, you know, why bother even showing up? Because, uh, you know, the Ferrari, uh, the elite uh, sports vehicle, <coughs> excuse me, is uh, going to be the Jacksonville Jaguars and Trevor Lawrence. And the uh, the long flowing hair is going to be coming to uh, coming to uh, the middle of Florida. So, but, uh, yeah, Urban Meyer down in uh, Jacksonville. It should be uh, should be exciting because Jacksonville has a uh, they already have a, a good nucleus of young talent. The Jacksonville is a team that's uh, drafted super well. You know, Miles Jack, one of the remaining players on that star-studded defense, <coughs> back a few years back. Um, my or Josh Allen is a uh, you know he's still a young pass rusher that could uh, you know keep getting better. So, but uh, yeah. So, yeah, make sure, you guys, if you guys have any draft questions, uh, go ahead. You can email me, partialbrand at gmail.com. It's under my About section on YouTube and uh, under Business Inquiries. So, also, if you guys want to call into the show, uh, that would be awesome. And, uh, yeah, you if you uh, – or say you're a fan of, um, you know, Denver Broncos or whatever, you could call in and, you know, ask me questions. So, yeah, Daniel Jeremiah's mock draft. He has uh, the four quarterbacks going in the top ten. And uh, we'll look at some of these other – react to some of these other picks. Uh, Cowboys, Patrick Sertan at 10. Yeah, I think this makes a lot of sense uh, for the Cowboys. This is a team that uh, needs to uh, improve in a lot of facets on the defensive side of the ball. I think, you know, getting a guy that's, you know, ready to go right now. And, uh, you know, I, Jerry Jones that really drafts really well. He likes to take the uh, stars from the uh, big-time schools. If you look at, you know uh, – C.D. Lamb, Ezekiel Elliott, Lamb, Oklahoma, Ohio State. I think that pick makes a lot of sense as far as, you know, if you dive deep into the mind of Jerry Jones is what he's thinking. And uh, and say what you want about Jerry Jones, I criticize him, but he drafts uh, very well, and it seems like a lot of these guys kind of fall into the uh, Cowboys' lap. So Sertan could fall into the Cowboys' lap right here. And, uh, yeah, he has Sertan going uh, first corner off the board, I believe. Uh, yes, he does. And uh, Pitts to the Eagles. Uh, which made some, which would make some sense too, because uh, having a great pass catching tight end uh, would help uh, a young Jalen Hurts a lot. Interesting here, he has the Giants taking Gregory Rousseau. Um, I mean, if you're a Giants fan, I think this pick makes some sense because you need a guy that can rush the darn passer and get after someone. Um, the Giants, hey, I've had that problem for a few years now. Rousseau, bottom line is. Uh, you know, how, how hard does he want to work? What's his work ethic like? That's something I can't really gauge and haven't really heard uh, necessarily a discussion. But, uh, you know, how good does he want to be? So we'll see. We'll see uh, if, you know, if uh, the Giants go that route and, uh, you know, get Rousseau there, how much he can help them, especially year one. I think Rousseau could be a guy that uh, uh, either really shines or uh, really disappears year one. San Francisco, Rashawn Slater, offensive tackle. Yeah, the bottom line is, what does San Francisco want to do with Trent Williams? He's a uh, you know a free agent getting up there at age. Has been one of the best tackles in the league, and uh, I haven't really got to watch a lot of tape on Rashawn Slater. He, he's a you know a guy like Suell could be you know could play guard, could play tackle. So we'll see there. 
L.A. Chargers getting Jalen Waddle, that would be quite something because, you I mean, Keenan Allen, Mike Williams, you add another explosive weapon for Justin Herbert, and this is a team that, uh, you know, you get Anthony Lynn out of there as head coach and uh, hopefully a team that doesn't blow as many leads, and if they take another step offensively, if they get healthier on defense, this is a Chargers team that could improve a lot, and, uh, you know, with an explosive offense, have me tuning in to, you know, quite a few more games to, uh, you know, watch uh, watch that, so. Says the Vikings taking Devontae Smith at 14. I don't know. I don't think I see Smith falling that far because, like I said, I think with, with his flash of production this year at Alabama, I think one of these first, you know, top 10 teams will fall in love with him. So I, 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 don't, I have a hard time seeing him fall to Minnesota, but that would be uh, quite something for Kirk Cousins. You add another, you know, just a, a guy that, you know, is kind of similar to uh, Jefferson, a little bit skinnier but has worked so hard at his ability to, uh, you know, uh, get open and, uh, you know, just uh, just catch everything. So, yeah, you kind of have two guys that are, would be very similar, Devontae Smith and Justin Jefferson. Obviously still have Adam Thielen there, a guy that's, you know, done a lot of good things. Uh, but number 15, Patriots going uh, Jace Horn. I think this would be pretty awesome. There's been, uh, yeah, a lot of uh, talk about what happens with Gilmore, so – if you move on from Gilmore for whatever reason, um, yeah, because Gilmore, his contract expires after the 2021 season. So, yeah, you could have Horn and Gilmore, two, uh, two very um, potential stud corners there. And, uh, you know, if, if Horn's that good, you can, you know, maybe move off of uh, Gilmore after that or, uh, you know, it, he's getting up there in age or re-sign him and you have, uh, you know, a couple uh, – good corners if uh you know if gilmore's production stays at a high level so look at other notable picks uh the raiders taking quitty pay um i think that makes a lot of sense you know this this raiders defense kind of uh underachieved and i they i watched a lot of games they played super hard but they just kind of you know, struggled to uh, stop teams from moving the ball. I think, uh, you know, you got Max Crosby there. You know, Farrell is, you know, been, been all right, I guess. Um, if Quiddy Pay comes in there and uh, could just be uh, at least a solid starter, it keeps adding more and more depth. But, um, you know, I, I question the Raiders draft really this year because it's just like it seems like almost, you know, Mayock, which is something – Mayock and, and Gruden, it seems like they're – they kind of take guys that are a little too safe. Like like Arnett was a great competitor, but you look at his 40 time, a 4-5 or five guy, he's dealt with some injuries, and, uh, you know, there was some maturity issues. Um, <laughs> I don't really like that he, you know, dyed his hair, but that <laughs> yeah, that's just beside the point. But, uh, I mean, I guess it doesn't look terrible. But, you know, I, I like Arnett as a competitor, but he's not – he never was a guy that – I don't think he was a guy that you take first round. I mean, I think if they really wanted an elite corner, they should have tried to, you know, move up and get C.J. Henderson. Because if it wasn't Okuda, it was Henderson. Those two guys were kind of um, the in the mix. You know, Okuda didn't have a, a great year, let's be honest. But, you know, I think he still even has a higher ceiling than his teammate Arnett because, you know, Arnett wasn't even the best player on Ohio State. I mean, he was okay for uh, the Raiders this year. But uh, – yeah, so, and I mean, Travion Mullen's been okay. They've drafted a lot of guys that have been okay. Um, that first draft, to me, was, uh, you know, really good. Josh Jacobs has been a star running back, but now you're almost just trying to get too safe, and you can't you can't just play it too safe. I think that's the, Ra- the Raiders' problem. you got to take some, some risks with some guys. I mean, that's how you ended up with Khalil Mack. It's, Khalil Mack, um, it looks like that trade has, you know, has kind of been uh, – kind of been a, almost a wash uh, you know they've got some good players but they haven't obviously they haven't found a guy as good as Cleo Mack which is just to, to say they were going to find a guy as good or better is not really realistic but I think you know they were trying to build something and uh, you know one of the teams that beats the, the Chiefs this year so I'm not giving up on Gruden and the Raiders but uh, you know picking again in the middle of the pack it's just like you know next year I think this is really a year for you know Gruden and uh you know, Mayock to have a good draft, find an elite, you know, elite, not a, not necessarily an elite guy, but a solid starter. They could, you know, keep getting you, keep getting you better and, you know, closing the gap on, you know, the chiefs in that division. Cause let's be honest, the, uh, you know, the road kind of goes through the chiefs in a way. Cause you know, if you're, I mean, not, not that you have to beat them to get to the playoffs, but 
you know, if you want to be um, a Super Bowl team, you're going to have to show that you can beat, you know, the Chiefs consistently, and they've done that one out of the two times this year. So, at uh, pick 18, the Miami Dolphins getting them a heck of a player running back, Najee Harris. And the thing is, I love Najee Harris. And it all comes down to how much you value the running back position. Um, Najee Harris, one of the kind of the knocks on him was, how is is he going to be able to break tackles and kind of have that stop and start that he did against you know NFL linebackers? Is a big question this year. But you know Najee Harris is a uh, he is a guy that his work ethic is really second to none, and uh, so um, I think that. Uh, yeah, I think this could be a great pick for the Dolphins. They were rolling out Miles Gaskin and, uh, you know, some younger guys that were okay at running back. But Najee Harris and him and uh, a chance to, um, you know, come back and uh, reunite with his teammate Tua could be outstanding. And, uh, yeah, his his involvement in the passing game was critical. I think he should have won the Heisman this year, uh, but that's beside the point. But uh, bottom line, he can make the Dolphins a uh, heck of a lot better on offense. And if they choose to go to a, he'd have a, a guy that he's comfortable with, and they could help him make plays in the passing game in the you know the dink and dunk game. Some nothing wrong with that. Something that Tua likes to uh, do a lot. So Washington Christian Darasaw from Virginia Tech. I think this makes a lot of sense because if you're Washington, I think you got to really be content as far as defense, and that's something people will kind of beat to death heading into this draft. Chase Young, Jonathan Allen, uh, star power on the defensive side of the ball. We could go on about that all day. Bottom line is you got to get better on uh, the offensive side of the ball, and why not take a tackle? Dara Shaw kind of varies. He's uh, kind of the consensus top three offensive tackle. What other, uh, you know, not – not kind of uh, more of two, uh, two or three. Um, not really debated whether he's better than Sue Well, but uh, you know had a good year for Virginia Tech. So pick makes sense here at number nineteen. Gadarius Tony, number twenty to the Chicago Bears. You know I think that uh, I think that'd be a fine pick, Gadarius Tony. I think that'd be a great value. At 20, Kadarius Tony could be like the Jefferson of this draft, like I mentioned. Kind of the, the consensus number, you know, three to four wide receiver. Uh, not really talked about is the best, but uh, his ability to get open would be, you know, be, be something for, you know, whoever plays quarterback for the Bears could uh, help him out. And, uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, in Chicago, they they just don't I, – I, when I watch the Bears offense, it's kind of painful to watch. So another explosive playmaker will, you know, could help out down in the in the Windy City. So other notable picks, Jalen Phillips. Okay, edge rusher to the Titans. I think this is an interesting pick. Uh, you know, Phillips is a guy that really shined this year. Uh, I think that, uh, yeah, his uh, – his production, obviously, uh, Titans team that you know struggled to rush the passer. I think this pick makes a lot of sense. So, yeah, we'll wrap with that there, guys. Thanks for tuning in to Big Time Football Talk. Till next time, peace.